Hello. Yes, this is Sir Hubert Ware's house. And now I'm his secretary, Marston Gurney. Who's speaking? Oh, Mr. Ingleworth. Uh, yes, I do happen to know something about the matter. Yes. Yes. And the total sum? Serious as that. Yes. Couldn't it be carried over? It must be met by Thursday. Well, you know it can't be. Well, you know, Sir Hubert, all he'll say is, it's an hard life. Uh, very well, thank you. Goodbye. Hello, Eustace, did you find those tennis balls? No, I didn't. To have to hunt for balls on an insufferably hot day and clamber over beastly wire netting is hell for one's flannel. Do you good. If you could get a smear or two of the earth on you, it wouldn't hurt you. Oh, shut up. By the way, I'm off to Canada tomorrow. Well, I hope the boat sinks. Thanks. And if I get the job I'm after, the chances are I may not see you again before you come of age. To man's estate, as they're pleased to call it. Oh, do shut up. When I look at you and Lady Ware, I can't believe you're her brother at all. Oh, oh! What the devil's the matter? There's a wasp. Oh, I hate them. Take it away, Marston. Go to blazes. Look, he's settled on the table. Now, there, I've got him. Got what? A wasp, Magda. He's been trying to sting me. Oh, nonsense. He was Celia, but I've got him under this glass. And now I'm going to finish him. You're going to do nothing of the kind, Eustace. Let him go. I'm not going to let him go. Watch my artistic method. I let him die slowly by nicotine poison. Give me that glass. Magda, you let it go. You seem to take a delight in torturing anything even more insignificant than yourself. That's a nice sisterly remark. Oh, it's not only that wretched little wasp, but everything. It's inconceivable that you're nearly 21 and coming into a large fortune. You're jealous. That's what's the matter with you. Don't be more unpleasant than you can help. Home truths are rather unpleasant, aren't they? Oh, look out, Eustace. There's that wasp again. Where? Where? On your back. <laughs> Don't do that. It hurts. <laughs> oh, damn you. You're all very funny. <laughs> oh, poor Eustace. <laughs> Before I forget, Marston, what time does the boat train leave tomorrow? Ten o'clock. Oh, then I'd better order the car for you at half past eight. Oh, thanks awfully. Are you going to see him off, Celia? Uh, no, I... Well, I'd rather stay here with you. Lady, where... I'm awfully sorry to have to leave you and Sir Hugh. You do realise, don't you, that it's a great chance if I get this job. Of course. Still, it'll always be a time to look back on. And, of course, I should never have met Celia if it hadn't been for you. No, darling. Yes, that's one good thing that happened. Do you know where Sir Hubert is? I have a message for him. He's playing tennis with Sir Henry Edgerton. He walked over after lunch. I wonder if he has any further news of his brother's horse. His brother's horse? Yes, aeroplane. It's the ledger today, you know. It's an absolutely open race. I <laughs> thought you'd done with all that at Cambridge. So I had. I wish I'd backed it both ways. Marston, could I have a back? <laughs> a what? A back. Uh, you mean have a bit on? <laughs> yes. I'll ask Edgerton's <laughs> advice. <laughs> Dear old Marston, I wish he could have stayed with us. So do I. But that's out of the question now that Wilbury has to go. And the flat, too. The flat, too? Oh, my God. Dear, it's a rent of over a thousand a year. We can't keep it on. Well, has Sir Hubert lost as heavily as that? Yes, practically everything. But surely he well, must he, have... What he hasn't gambled away, he's squandered on... <sighs> I've been one of a number for years. My marriage was a mistake. I shall never be forgiven. Why did you do it, Magda? I had to marry well, Father said, because apart from a small settlement, he was going to leave everything to Eustace. Oh, yes, but surely... Oh, when... he meant it all for the best, I suppose. And he persuaded me into it. <laughs> Hubert was charming and all that, and... Well, I made the mistake. I shall never be forgiven. You're not let off lightly for that. Oh, Magda, you mustn't blame yourself. Edgerton still thinks aeroplanes all right, so if you want a bit oh, of... Oh, uh, well, well, could I have a shilling's worth? <laughs> oh, my dear child. Well, five shillings, then. Each way. Oh, does that mean first or last? <laughs> no, darling, the first three. <laughs> oh, oh, dear, I am a fool. <laughs> oh, well, Celia... There's one thing I'd lay any money on. When you're married, you will never have the feeling for your husband that I have for mine. Yes, I, I know what you mean. Yes, but other people don't. They think of Hubert as the most generous person that ever walked, who'd give his last shilling to help a pal. What are you going to do, Magda? Go on, I suppose. Excuse me, my lady. Mr. Aid was on the telephone. He's on his way from town. Thank you, Red. It's a long time since M.A. came, isn't it? Yes, it is, rather. Oh, what a position to have reached at his age. Yes. Only 37, isn't he? Yes. Finest advocate at the bar. 
the best speaker in the House. Marston said it's any odds on M.A. being Attorney General in the next government. And it's just like him to turn up when one needs him. Celia, do you know that I could have married Michael? Married him? Yes, but he never gave me an inkling that he cared for me in that way. I only found out by accident a year after my marriage. My dear fellow, I won my superior play. There's no doubt about that. Well, Lady Ware, I have given your husband a severe beating. Yes, you <laughs> blackguard. I've never seen you in better form. Phew. A long game of tennis immediately after lunch when you're nearing 50. 60. Rubbish. <laughs> 60. And the thermometer 79 in the shade. I meant to be fit for a very complicated case I have to go to Scotland Yard about tonight. A murder? Well, yes, it is a murder. One out of the top drawer. Now, what do you mean by one out of the top drawer? Well, one that takes the entire theatrical profession to the Old Bailey. This might be if ever it got as far as the Old Bailey. It's the Soho murder. Yes, a beauty. Oh, nonsense. A horrible story. An absolutely <laughs> horrible story. You know, Edgerton, nine times out of ten, your criminals are never caught. I'm afraid you're not far wrong. It's getting rather monotonous. I'm inclined to agree with you. As chief of the criminal investigation department, you're the wrong man for the job. Thank you. You are. You're becoming a public scandal. <laughs> oh, it's a shame, Sir Henry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but joking apart, murder like this Soho one is a good deal more intricate than the public imagine. Even when you catch your bird, the evidence must be pretty conclusive. Just one weak bar in the cage, and away he flies. Until he's caught again? On a fresh charge, you mean? No, the same one. Oh, no. Uh, well, suppose you found some new evidence after he'd got off. Worthless. He could never be retried. What? If acquitted, he could walk out into Newgate Street and publicly proclaim his guilt. And we should be powerless to stop him. But don't make me talk shop. The most interesting shop there is. To you, I know, you morbid wretch. Yes. I have a pile of books on it here, English and French. Look. Celebrated Trials, six volumes. La Criminalité Comparée. There's an accent for you. <laughs> La Criminologie. Oh, and a whole lot more. I was reading a fascinating little murder last night, a French one. Ah, I never entered it in my diary. Your diary, really? I enter every first-class crime in my diary on the date I first read it. You really are the limit. Can I talk business with you, Sir Hubert? Oh, Lord Marston, must we? I'm afraid so. Come along with Celia and show me the rose garden and leave them to their business. <laughs> yes, I'd love to. Oh, why the new hairstyle, Marston? What? Right? Oh, Lord, I went down to the lake for a swim. I haven't <laughs> had time to brush it. No, obviously. <laughs> uh, by the way, Sir Hubert, you haven't signed that letter to Lausanne about you, sir. Oh, no. I word you're being kind to him. Well, after all, he is my wife's brother. Yes. I've enclosed Lady Ware's cheque, so we'd better seal it. Yes, I suppose so. I found out about the family he's going to. They're very nice people. Mm. After all, he's a delicate boy, and I should like him to have every comfort. Pity he didn't go to school or university. It would have done him good. Mm, perhaps. Worse than a pity he's coming into all this money. Lady Ware should have had it. Marston, I never thought you had a mercenary mind. I'm sorry, but I loathe the fellow. Look, Sir Hubert, mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you before the others, but Ingleworths have rung up to say you must settle their account by Thursday or action will be taken. Oh, have they? Oh, well, it's an odd life. <laughs> you know, you're amazing the way you take it. My dear fellow, once in the tumbril, you've got to face the music. I wish to heaven I had money. I wish you had, old chap. <laughs> Perhaps you will if you get this Canadian job. I hope so. Um, we've got a match. I say, hello. I've got a five-pound note. <laughs> I didn't know there was so much money in the world. There's a man in the hall, Sir Hugh, hmm? I can't get rid of him. Uh, this is his car. Ah. Tommy Bold. Tommy Bold? Why, of course I'll see him. Show him in, rate. Very good, sir. Tommy Bold, the bookie? Yes, there's only one Tommy Bold. <laughs> He's had his whack out of me in his time. I haven't heard of him for ages. What's happened to him? Gone to the devil, I believe. <laughs> Mr. Bold. <coughs> well, 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 Tommy. How are you? Uh, done, sir. Smashed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was out in Hyde Park all last night. Lucky it's hot and fine. And this morning, I didn't know where to turn. So I pulled myself together and started to walk the 12 miles down here to see you. You walked, Tommy? That's right, sir. Really? I remembered how well you'd always treated me in my prosperous days. <laughs> always paid my losses, you mean? That's right, sir. Ah, but I always paid your mind, didn't oh, I? I think you only lost to me once, Tommy, eh? That's right, sir. Granborough, Middle Park <laughs> Plate. You took 12 ponies off me <laughs> then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, sir... 
I believed you'd treat me well again when I'm down on me luck. I, I, I know it's my own fault. I didn't run straight once. I... <coughs> my God, I've paid for it. Oh, come on, Tommy. Come on, come on. Sit down. <laughs> What's a man to do when he's desperate? I've been in jail once and that finished me. I can't get up out of it. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> You hear that cough? Yes, I do. Well, the last doctor I saw didn't give me very long. Oh, my dear Tommy, I'm sorry. Look, uh, how can I help you? Yeah, just a trifle, sir. I want me to stop the, stop the pain. Yes, of course. Ring the bell, Marston. Right. Uh, here you are, Tommy. Cool. Five pounds, sir? Mm-hmm. Oh, God bless you. Oh, I shall never forget this, <laughs> never. You rang, sir? Yes, Ray. Give my friend here a good luncheon and some champagne. Very good, sir. Uh, go with him, Tommy. Right, go. And before you return to town, take a stroll in the grounds. It'll do you good. I should be able to say behind your back, sir, what I feel. Hmm? I'll tell some of that crowd how good the rich can be to the poor. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a tub of me own in Hyde Park and paint it royal blue. <laughs> Marston, Guernsey has everything he wants. Yes, of course. Come with me, Mr. Bowler. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Tommy. Hubert, who was that? That? Oh, an old friend of mine. Oh. Magda... I want to speak to you for a moment. And I want to speak to you. All right, you begin then. I want to know your exact financial position. I told you. I'm broke. But something must be done. Well, what? I don't know. Well, but... do you suppose I haven't racked my brains? <laughs> well, why not sell Wilbury? Mortgaged up to the hilt, and I can't even meet the interest. Besides, that's a drop in the ocean. Then Eustace, could he help? Would his trustees be sufficiently accommodating? Can't you picture their faces when you ask them? What exactly do you owe? Exactly, my dear Magda, is a word I shy at. The fact is that in the space of four years, the whole of my capital has evaporated. And I can't meet certain claims they're making on me. Oh, it's awful. Well, I'm not pretending it's particularly exhilarating. Well, how much have you got? Well, let's see. Um... Four shillings and, um, tenpence halfpenny exactly. Oh, you. <laughs> Put that paper down. Put it down. That's quite enough, Magda. I will not have this damned interference. I believe it gives you a fiendish delight to see me lose my temper. It's an entertainment you've constantly treated me to for the last three years. That's a longish run. Much too long. What do you mean? Are you going to leave me? No. I'm going to do what only a fool would do. I'm going to stand by you. You're very generous. Oh, don't misunderstand me. There's no love in it. You've killed that and every fragment of respect entirely. But I shall stay under the same roof and support you, so far as my income will allow. Unless you prefer that I should leave you and make you a regular allowance. I should be better off if we were together, shouldn't I? On the restaurant principle that one portion does for two. Precisely. <laughs> Oh, by the way, uh, talking of your income, you were wise to take my advice to sell your Great Western debentures. I hope so. Mm. I wanted you to sell at a good profit and to reinvest in the ordinary stock. It'll yield a better dividend. It just needs your signature. Oh, I'll sign whenever you like. Ah. Well, I'll ring for Rate. He can be the witness. Hello, you two. Oh, hello, Michael. M.A. Well, oh, my dear fellow, how are you? All the better for seeing you both. Oh, Mike, you've just turned up at the right moment. You can witness my signature. No, but my dear, to bombard a man just as he's arrived. Well, a lawyer would be a much better witness than a butler, wouldn't he? Well, he might be just as good. <laughs> May I ask the nature of the document? Oh, I want to take some money out of one thing and put it into another. Oh, I see. A transfer. That's it. My Great Western debenture stock. Oh, really? But is it wise? Well, I hope so. I mean, is it wise at this particular moment, in the present circumstances? Well, uh, uh, that's why I've run down to see you as an old friend. I've heard something. I'm awfully sorry. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Emma. Is it wiser? Well, I don't know. Might be a good thing to try to get a better yearly sum from oh, the capital. Don't bother him now, Magda. How are you going to reinvest? Well, Hubert thought... I thought Great Western Ordinary. Is this transfer your own wish? Well, Hubert advised me. Oh, still, I, 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 I may have been wrong. Yes, yes, of course. We can all make mistakes sometimes. Well, here it is, so I'll sign it. There. 
No, I'll, I'll just see that's all in order for you, if I oh, may. Oh, any time, Michael. This is a bit of an infliction on a friend, just as he arrives. Not the slightest. Oh, hello, Mr. Aid. Oh, how are you, Eustace? Fairly well, thanks, except for the wasps and the heat. Going to bathe, eh? Yes. Best thing in the heat. Yes, but this lake's beastly, you know. It's so full of pike, and I'm terrified of them. They'll be much more afraid of you. I think so. Oh, by the way, Eustace, I've sent my letter about you to the people at Lausanne. I'm sure they'll be kind to you. Thanks, you, but awfully decent of you. I'll see you when I get back, Mr. A. Uh, I hope so. Don't stop in too long, Eustace. No, I won't. You know, I'd, I don't think that this great Western... Um, will you leave Mike and me for a little while, Magda? I want to talk things over with him. Only a minute. Of course. Well, I don't quite follow this transfer. No? It's not what your wife imagines it to be. Well, what do you mean? It's something entirely different. Different? Well, how? I, I don't follow. And I'd better be candid. You're trying, without your wife's knowledge, to obtain her signature to a deed which would transfer the whole of her capital in this investment to your name and give you the power to do what you like with it. Does Magda realise this? Yes. Then I must tell her I can't witness her signature to a deed which is so entirely different from what I understood and, I feel sure, from what she understood. I'll go to her now. No, no, please. No, don't mention this to her. But I thought that you said... No, look, wait, for heaven's sake. My wife's been awfully good to me. I know she And has. this might... Was I right, then? You were deceiving her? Yes, I see. I've been driven almost mad and didn't realise what I was doing. Don't tell her, Amy. Don't tell her. Very well, I won't. If the result thank. comes from Celia, I'll let you know. Oh, thanks, Maggie. Oh, she's coming you. back. What will you say? You must leave that to my discretion. I think my pocket is the safest place for this. I'll burn it when I get home. Well, can I come back? Mm. Have you witnessed my signature? Yes, <laughs> it's all done. Hubert, aren't you leaving Sir Henry rather a long oh, time? Good Lord, I've forgotten all about him. See you later, Amy. All uh, right. So Edgerton's here? Yes, he walked over from his cottage. He has to go to town tonight. Don't you think Hubert's amazing? To look at him, you'd never realise the state of his affairs, would you? Nor a great many other things. Magda, I'm awfully sorry of what I've heard. That's why I came down, to see if I could help in any way at all. Thanks, Mike, but there's nothing that anyone can do. Nothing. <sighs> well, well, at any rate, I may try to extract a promise from you. Of course. What is it? Never to undertake any financial transaction before consulting me, no matter what it may be. That's to say, if you value my opinion. I promise. And you know how I value your opinion, Mike. Thanks. Oh, I suppose Hubert's affairs are becoming common knowledge. Yes, I'm afraid so. Some papers came into my chambers this morning, which mean bankruptcy for him. Oh, the disgrace of it all. And there's absolutely no excuse. No. Oh, my dear, it's terrible for you. I don't know if you'll think I'm doing right, but I've decided to stay with him. We shall live somehow on my income. Magda, if, if only you would let me help you. I should like to feel I was the one person who could help you. No, Mike. I've known you a long time now. Not that that gives me any right to... But still, I should... Oh, it maddens me. It makes me rebel. It's no good rebelling, Mike. I shall simply have to do the best I can. This situation would never have arisen if your father's will had been a fair one. I suppose so. That boy Eustace to come into all that money, it's a scam. Mm, my father wasn't exactly an advocate of women's rights. No. <laughs> but what to do, that's the point. I'm so useless. If I could type or do shorthand... Of course, I might run a hat shop. If I can do nothing else, I can choose a hat. But for a hat shop, you want capital, don't you? Don't talk like this. <laughs> I'm just trying to be practical. I can't bear it. That's all. You've got a quarter of an hour anyway, Edgerton, before your train goes. That's all right, then. Hello, Aid. How are you? You arrive and I'm off. What, already? I must, worse luck. I've got to go up to to London about the Soho murder. Oh, uh, anything fresh? I'm not sure. I shall know tonight. A thin case. Yes, that struck me. If I'm in doubt, I think I must uh, consult Ware. He's a master at our job. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll be the result of the race. Ah, now if you're fake, master. And mine. You answer it, Celia. Oh, shall I? Look, supposing... Well, it can't be helped, that's all. 
Go on, answer it. Yes? Who is it? Turnford? Uh, yes, that's the chap. I I'm Celia Wilson. Never mind who you are. What? Beaten, I told you so. <laughs> it's one. What? One? Give me the phone. Hello? What? It's one? Aeroplane? You're sure? A-O-R-P. <laughs> it's one, it's one, it's one! Capital, you got 33 to one, you tell me. Yes. Good man. Well done, Mars. Yes. Well, I backed him too. Well, heavenly. Five shillings everywhere. Oh, hey. well, that makes ten pounds. Oh, can, I, can I speak to you for a moment, Sir Hubert? Oh, yes, what is it, Ray? Anything important? Uh, yes, Sir Hubert, I... Uh, in the hall, please. Oh, all right. Um, excuse me, everybody. Now, Marston, how much did you want? Well, I'll tell you, I, I did rather a bold thing, I'm afraid. I, I have a little bit of capital, and, well, I, I have a bit of capital, and I, I put a hundred on to win. A hundred? You lucky young devil. Then you, you've made... Yes, uh, 33 to one. Well, that's over 3,000 pounds. Yes, I, I won 3,000. Splendid, Marston, I'm so glad. Thank you. Oh, Marston, you're a genius. Magda, <laughs> Magda. What's the matter? I... I don't know what to say. They called me out just now to tell me and... Yes? Eustace. Well, what about him? Well, one of the gardeners, he went to the bathing shed a few moments ago. He found Eustace's towel and clothes there, but... But the boy is not there. He's... <gasps> oh. Drowned? No doubt about it. Good Lord. It is, Celia, my dear. Canada certainly didn't bring me any luck. Oh, never mind, Marston, darling. Oh, it's so wonderful to have you back. I thought I was going to get the job all right, and they kept me hanging around all those weeks with the chuck at the finish. Oh, it's a shame. I'm in for something better, though. Hmm? I'll tell you later. All right, darling. I just had a few words with Lady Ware. How has she been? Well, she's much better now, but... Oh, it's been a dreadful time for her. It's been awful. I'll never forget the shock I got when I saw that paper in Montreal and read the verdict, willful murder against a person or persons unknown. Still, there was evidence. What I read wasn't enough to hang a dog oh, on. But master! Now listen, Celia. Eustace goes to bathe alone. Yes? He's about the worst swimmer going. And there's a bruise on his forehead caused I'll lay any money by some struggle or other to save himself by the punt. Yes, but the punt was found against the bank with the chain unfastened. Yes, but... And when they dragged the lake, the body was recovered from the weeds some way out. Well, Eustace must have undone the punt, because I fastened it tight after I bathed before him. I know, but he never used it. And Henson, the gardener, thought he saw a man fully dressed in the punt right away from the bank. Didn't you read that? No, but you can't rely on Henson, short-sighted and always on the beer. Mm, perhaps... Still, there you are. A coroner's jury's capable of anything. Well, there's one good side to it all. What's that? Magda coming into Eustace's money. And the good she's done with it. How do you mean? Well, she's paid all Sir Hubert's debts. She has? I knew she would. She's a darling. And so are you. <laughs> do you know, all the way over in that beastly boat... I thought of you and wondered how you'd look. And you look... Well, how do I look? That's how you look. <laughs> what do you say to marrying me in a couple of months' time? You game? Oh, of course I am. Can you face a bit of a pinch at the start? Of course a parson's daughter ought to manage that. Two months' time, then. I'm getting desperate. <laughs> Oh, desperate again, Marston. <laughs> no more aeroplanes, I hope. No, I've done with all ah, that. Ah, we've permanently retired from the horse course. <laughs> <laughs> Joking apart, though, 
I've given Celia my solemn word I'll never make a bet again. Good. <laughs> and now for the surprise. With the bit I already had, plus my win on aeroplane, I can afford to wait for a practice at the bar. That's what I'm going to do. And M.A. has been a brick. How do you mean? He's fixed it all up with his brother, who's taking me into his chambers. Oh, master! Oh, how good of mine. So I'm launching out, you see, and I've asked Celia to marry me in two months' time. Oh, I'm so glad for you both. Thank you. Thank you. Michael hasn't forgotten he's dining with us tonight, I hope. Oh, no, he was going home to dress. Uh, which I ought to be doing, by Jove. Shan't be long. Ah, this is splendid news, Celia. Yes, isn't it wonderful? Oh, and how sweet of M.A. to do that for Marston. Yes, he took a great fancy to you both down at Wilbury at that awful time. And then he knew I was anxious about you and... and Magda, what is it? Oh, it's nothing. Well, yes, nothing. there is something. Nothing that's new. Magda, do tell me what it is. It's Michael. Michael? He's always doing some good turn for me. Or for someone I care for. Try as I can I, to take it all for granted, I just can't. And I, I find myself asking his advice till I'm face to face with the fact that I'm making excuses for asking it. And finding him, well, indispensable. He loves me and I know it. And I love him and he knows it. But Magda... Well, he's said nothing in words, nor have I. There isn't any need. If he keeps away from me, I know the reason. If I avoid him, he knows the reason. As I suppose he knows why I asked him here tonight. Well, why have you asked him, Magda? Ninety-nine women out of a hundred, placed as I am. Would... Yes, but there's one woman who wouldn't, and that's you. What would you do if I did? I... I should be very sorry. Well, you needn't be afraid, Celia, my dear. Oh, is that the evening paper? Uh, yes. Oh, here's something on the front page about Eustace. Oh, what? The police offer £200 reward to anyone able to... Oh, why in heaven's name can't they let it rest? They can never discover anything now, even if there was anything to discover. Hello, you're both dressed early. Has Marston turned up? Ah, uh, yes. How is he? In great form. Ah, splendid. <laughs> He should have been with me today. I was putting like an angel. <laughs> oh. Anything wrong? Magda's upset at something in tonight's paper, Sir Hubert, about Eustace. Oh, yes, this reward. I saw it at the club. I'm so sorry, Magda. Well, something must be done to stop this. But what? I don't know, but something, anything, it's unbearable. The wife has sent the flowers up from Wilbury, my lady. Does your ladyship want them arranged on the dinner table? Yes, please, Ray. No, oh, Ray, I was going to ask you. Can't your wife arrange for someone else to take charge of Wilbury now? I mean, you must be anxious to have her back in London with you. Oh, I'm not in the least, Sir Hubert. No? Well, the wife's in, uh, well, delicate health just now. And, oh, uh, I had no idea. Uh, yes, my lady, she... She's expecting before long. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, thank you, my lady. I've also received a letter from the wife enclosed with the flowers. She tells me the police were down at Wilbury yesterday dragging the lake again. Oh. Again? Yes, Sir Hubert. But why? Well, it's only the police that can tell. The inspector went into the house also. Really? Into the house? Yes, Sir Hubert. He told the wife you gave him permission after the inquest to go wherever he liked. Mm. Well, he went from room to room, looking round with one of his men, but the wife stuck to them, which the wife was quick enough to see they didn't want, until they reached the library. There they ejected her and remained some time alone. In the library? Yes, but the wife felt quite comfortable about that, Sir Hubert, as all the cigars had been removed. That'll do, Rate. Yes, my lady. I tell you, Hubert, it's got to stop. Oh, they must do their duty, I suppose. Well, if there was any sense in it, yes. But when one knows they're going on simply because of that verdict, it's cruel. Well, you know, I've sympathised with you up to now, Magda, but there's one person we owe all this to, Henson. Yes. I was speaking about the evidence to Marston just now. Well, what does he think about it? Well, he places no reliance on it at all. Of course. If you hadn't insisted on overlooking that brawl of his in the village six months ago when he was head up before the bench and... We got rid of him, then we should have been spared all this. Oh, I know, it was my fault. Anyhow, when Sir Henry arrives, I shall beg him to do all he can to prevent this going on. Excuse me, my lady. 
Someone at Scotland Yard has rung up my lady to say Sir Henry Edgerton is prevented by important business from dining with your ladyship tonight. Thank mm. you, Felton. My lady. Well, it's a little late. Would you mind telling Rake for me, Celia? Uh, yes, of course. I'll, I'll help him do the flowers. Thank you. Well, I, I suppose I must go and dress. Just a moment. Hmm? I have something to say to you, Hubert. Or will it take long? I can be as brief as you wish. All right. I've decided it would be better if we lived apart. But why? Because it would be happier for both of us. Yes, but... At any rate, it would be happier for me. But... You've nothing to fear as regards money. A regular income will be provided for you. There'll be only one condition. What? That you don't exceed it. I shall do no more than I've agreed to do. I've arranged the deed today. And the amount of the income? Oh, I've not been ungenerous. Hmm. Magda, why this sudden decision? Sudden? Why, over and over again I've nearly left you. I ought to have gone when I first found you out. I see that now. But you know why I stayed. Because of the child. But after he died, you still stayed. Well, nothing seemed to matter then. Your faithlessness became monotonous. I got used to it. But since Eustace died, the position has altered completely. I've paid your debts. I've met every single one of your creditors in full. I've provided for others whose lives... For others? Were... Yes. I've settled the last case only today across the solicitor's table. Mrs. Scale was the woman's name. You owed her £2,000. <laughs> Look here, Magda. Can't we start afresh? No, it's too late for that. With two well-known people like ourselves, if we separate, there's bound to be gossip, publicity. Isn't this a time when, if we both do our best, we might help each other? Can't we start afresh, you know? No, it's impossible. You've never spoken so finally before. I don't want to be cruel, but all sympathy between us is dead. What could I do to revive it? Nothing. Mr. Aid. Ah, I'm in good time, I see. Ah, how are you, M.A.? Fairly fit, thanks. Except for the east wind. Oh. I'm becoming painfully conscious oh, of it. What nonsense. Oh, really? If I have to cross-examine a witness when the wind's in the west, I'm a perfect lamb. Hmm. But if it's in the east, I give him hell. <laughs> but at any rate, it hasn't stopped my keeping faith with you and coming early, as you asked me to do. Yes. Well, I must run and dress. I'll be as quick as I can. Mike, I may as well tell you now. This is the last time you'll dine with Hubert and me. We're going to separate. Finally? Finally. I see. Magda, I, I think I'd better not stay. Wouldn't it be better if no, I... No, no, Mike, I... I... I really think it would. No, don't do that. I'm nervous tonight. I'd, I'd like you to stay, just to steady me. Then, of course, I'll stay. Oh, but I was forgetting to thank you for a great kindness you've done today. Kindness? To Marston. Oh, that, that's oh, nothing. I'm so grateful to you for Marston. Celia's sake. Marston's all right, and my brother Dick's delighted to have him as a pupil. Yes, but it is good of you. <laughs> Nonsense. Magda, do you intend to live in this flat after you and Hubert have... Oh, yes. And to keep Wilbury? Oh, no, no. Don't let us talk of Wilbury. I'm sorry. Not that I can ever escape from it. I suppose you've seen the evening papers. Yes. Still, I'm afraid the police have to do their duty. But a search for a purely imaginary person... I'm afraid they don't think the person is purely imaginary. In fact, I know they don't. How do you know? Edgerton told me. I saw him three days ago. He was to have dined with us tonight. Isn't he coming? No, unfortunately. He's just telephoned that he can't. What did he say? Well, he and the director of public prosecutions take the view of the coroner's jury that it was foul play. But how can they? Well... Michael, you don't agree with them. Well, I do see their point of view. But on that evidence alone... There are certain things that are not consistent with an accidental death. What do you mean? Well, the, the bruise on the forehead caused before death was certainly consistent with a struggle of some kind. And then there's the evidence of the undergarden. Henson. Which, if it stood alone, I agree would amount to very little. But it doesn't stand alone. One has to take it with the rest. Yes, but the motive for such a crime. Ah, that's often the crux. Um, 
May, you are an angel. Thank you so much for your goodness to Marston. Oh, nonsense. We're both so grateful, Emma. Dinner is served, my lady. Thank you, Rate. Ah, good. I'm just in time. Well, my future Lord Chancellor Gurney, you'll look well in a full-bottom wig. <laughs> oh, yes, you will, Marston. <laughs> you ought to have been with me today at Sunningdale. I did an 82 in a gale of wind. 82? Yes, yeah, so that's saying something. I can tell you what to say. Hello. Will you wait here, Sir Henry, and I'll tell her ladyship? No, I don't want her ladyship to be told I'm here. Very well, Sir Henry. Her ladyship and Sir Hubert are at dinner, you say? Yes, Sir Henry, they've just gone in. It's not a party? No, only Mr. Aid, Mr. Gurney and Miss Wilson. Well, I want you to give this note quietly to Sir Hubert, without disturbing anyone else or mentioning my name. You understand? Perfectly, Sir Henry. I thought you couldn't come. Is anything wrong? I'm afraid there is. Your wife doesn't know I'm here. No, you asked me in your note not to mention your name. She just thinks someone's come on important business. That's all right, then. What's the matter? You you look like a thundercloud. I have an appalling task to perform. How do you mean? Well, can I help you in any way? You can, Ware. Good. Fire ahead, then. You can help me by trying to keep your nerve and by believing that never in my life have I suffered as I'm suffering now. Well, I'll try. Let's have it. This evening, a warrant has been issued for your arrest. My, my arrest? Yes. For what in heaven's name? The murder of Eustace Ede. What? Shh. You... You're joking, Edgerton. Or oh, you're mad. You don't know what you're saying. You... I... Good God! Steady now. Control yourself. Control myself? And... And the grounds for this arrest? Now, I'm afraid I have to forget that I'm a friend and become an official. I have brought men with me whom you must question if you think fit. But as a friend, though, let me advise you to say as little as possible when you go with them. You will have ample opportunity... Of... Oh, proving the stupidity of such a charge of exposing a blasted conspiracy. And I'll take the opportunity. I'll take it, Edgerton. Sir Henry. But I thought you... Lady, where are I... Magda, uh... I'll tell you myself. It was so serious, it'd be childish. What? And that's the way you and I must look at it. Look at what? I'm accused of the murder of your brother, Eustace. Oh, no! I beg you to believe, Lady Ware, my duties have never placed me in such an awful position before. But I can't believe it. Well, surely you could have prevented this. Prevented? Yes, by telling the truth about what happened that afternoon. You were there, in the house at the time. Well, I was in the garden. Oh, that's a fine quibble the law can make use of, I suppose. But this is not the moment for quibbles, Sir Henry. My husband, at the time my brother met his death, was in the library with me and Mr. Aid here. That's quite right, Sir Henry. He then joined you on the tennis lawn. You you know that perfectly well. Forgive me, but this is not the place I feel for that me. we're wasting Sir Henry's time. Your people in the hall will be growing impatient. Let's get it over. Yes, we'd better go. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Magda, is there anything in the world I can do for you? Yes, Michael, there is. Will... Will you defend him? Yes, my dear. I'll defend him. Is the prison doctor here? Yes, my lord. I understand the prisoner is now better. 
Is he fit to return to the witness box for his cross-examination to be resumed? Quite, my lord. It's only weakness. He's been very ill in the prison with pneumonia. Yes, I understand that. Is the prisoner there? Yes, my lord. Very well. Have him brought in. Will you come back, please, into the witness box? If you like to sit, you may do so. Thank you, my lord. I'd rather stand. Very well. You may proceed, Mr. Attorney. Thank you, my lord. I shall now pass from the financial side of the matter. On that fateful afternoon on September the 10th, you've told my learned friend, Mr. Aid, in your examination in chief, that you were in the library when your brother-in-law went to bathe. That is so. For how long did you remain there? I couldn't say exactly. Um... Turn more to the jury. Sorry, my lord. What made you eventually leave the room? My wife thought I was neglecting Sir Henry Edgerton, who was on the tennis lawn. Then what did you do? What did I do? Yes. What did you do? I joined Sir Henry. How soon? Oh, in a few minutes. I didn't catch that answer, Mr. Attorney. Uh, my lord, in a few minutes, the witness said. How long would it take you to go direct to the law? Oh, not long, of course. It's so near? Yes. How near? Oh, about a hundred yards. Or perhaps only fifty. It's possible. I've never measured it. Uh, then just outside the library window, one can see the tennis lawn? Yes. Is this the same plan which gives the elevation of the house? Yes, my lord, it's marked B. The one which shows that owing to the trees, the end of the lake in question cannot be seen from any of the windows? Yes, my lord. I follow. Yes. And from the lawn, anyone could equally well see you? I suppose so. Oh, but Sir Henry Edgerton did. He expressly said so in his evidence. Oh, yes, I... I forgot for the moment. He's told us further that he saw you descend those six steps to the lower level of the garden not in the direction of the tennis lawn, and that you did not join him for a quarter of an hour. How do you reconcile that with your previous answer? I... I was extremely worried that day. Oh, then Sir Henry is inaccurate in describing you as being in excellent spirits. I take it to be one's duty to hide one's feelings from one's guests sometimes. I'm glad I succeeded so well. Go on, please. I did go down the steps Sir Henry speaks of, but... I only sat down on a seat for a minute or two before going round to the tennis lawn. Can that seat be seen from the tennis lawn? No, my lord. So no one saw you sitting there? I suppose not. Might it have been longer than a minute or two that you sat down? Really, I... Might it have been five minutes? Perhaps it might. I tell you, I was terribly worried and I was trying to think what to do. Might it have been ten minutes? Well... Or fifteen? No, no, no. It couldn't have been as long as that. Uh, may I take it that when your wife suggested you are joining Sir Henry, you meant to follow the suggestion? Yes. Then why not take the nearest way? I... I could no more give reasons for my movements that day than I could fly. Now, from that seat you speak of, how long would it take you to walk quickly to the bathing shed? Oh, very little time. It's no distance. Certainly not more than a hundred yards. Silence in court. Well, now, we've heard that the police discovered at Wilbury this volume of French crimes and your book diary. Uh, you had been in the habit of reading that sort of thing? It was a hobby. I was steeped in crime. <laughs> Silence! And as you told my friend, it was your practice to enter the crimes you read in the diary. And other books, too. Oh, yes, I agree. But can you account for the remarkable coincidence that you read the... The Farm Pond Murder, a story strangely similar to the one we're investigating the day before Eustace Ede's death. Well, it is simply, as you say, a coincidence. There was no secret about it. Why, that very afternoon I told Sir Henry Edgerton about it. Yes, did you tell him what kind of murder it was? No, but if he'd asked me, I should have told him. Let me have that volume of French crimes and the book diary. Uh, yes, my lord. Mm. One moment, Mr. Attorney. I see there's a turned-down page. 
Is that what the detective swore to? Uh, yes, my lord. I have turned down the page myself, my lord, while reading it. I follow. Yes, go on, Mr. Attorney. Where do you generally keep that book diary? On my writing table, lying openly on the top. And was it there upon that day? Yes, I'm sure it was. Can you account, then, for its subsequent discovery in one of the bookcases out of sight some way back? No, I can't. Did you remove it there? No. You're quite definite about yes, that Yes, quite definite. What makes you so definite? I'll explain. Our departure from Wilbury... Oh, that... yes, but I've not got to that. My lord, my friend must allow the witness to explain. Yes, Mr. Attorney, I think the witness is entitled to give his explanation in his own way. Yes? Our departure from Wilbury after the inquest was hurried. We were all anxious to get away. I knew I'd left the diary on the table, and just before I left, I went to look for it. Why? I wanted to pack it and take it to town. What for? I nearly always had it by me to enter any fresh books. But... Well? I couldn't find it. The table had been removed against the wall when... my brother-in-law was placed there. I can only imagine that in the turmoil the diary fell on the floor and that one of the servants or somebody placed it without thinking on the first shelf that was handy. Did you mention its disappearance to anyone? No. I only thought of it at the last moment and then, as I say, I longed to get away from the place. I think, Sir John, you would have had the same feeling. Well, now, your signet ring, which the police found in the lake... You told my learned friend that you were wearing it that day. I repeat, I sealed a letter with it that very afternoon in Mr. Gurney's presence. Uh, you're referring to this letter, Exhibit H? Yes, my lord. The one Sir Hubert Ware wrote to Switzerland expressing a wish for his brother-in-law's comfort on the very day when charged with designedly killing him. Oh, surely, Mr. A, that's argument. It'll be for the jury to put their own construction on Which it. I have little doubt they will. In accordance with this letter of yours to the Swiss family, was your brother-in-law to start for Lausanne on the following Monday? He was, my lord. Were you fond of him? No, my lord. I can't say I was. You say no? It would be an affectation for me to pretend that I was. He was not a likeable boy. I... I was friendly with him, but beyond that... Go on, please, Mr. Attorney. Uh, that letter was sealed before Eustace Ede met his death. On your oath, were you wearing the ring after he met his death? On my oath, I was. You follow my point? Perfectly. The doctor swore that the bruise and the mark on Eustace's forehead could have been caused by a blow from a hand wearing that ring. It's sufficient just to answer the Attorney General's questions. It would be for the jury to consider the evidence. Yes, my lord. Do you seriously suggest to the jury that your explanation of the subsequent discovery of this ring in the lake is a satisfactory it's one. It's the only one I can give, and it's true. Repeat it. I've already told you Repeat I... Repeat it. That ring was found by the police when they dragged the lake a second time weeks later. Well? Three days after the catastrophe, early in the morning, it was insufferably hot, and I was restless and unable to sleep. So I went down to the lake and bathed. From the same spot. Go on. Well, I lost the ring then. It was always a shade large. Did you mention the loss to anyone at the time? No, I don't think I did. Aren't you sure you didn't? Well, yes, I am. Then why not say so? It was a pity you didn't mention it, wasn't it? I agree with you entirely. But at that awful time, the loss of an ordinary signet ring was of less importance somehow than the inquest and other matters. Do you wish the jury to believe that you were able to bring yourself to bathe in that spot three days after this ghastly thing had happened? That is what I am asking them to believe. Was anyone in the house aware of this bathe? No, unfortunately. Can you produce here a single witness to corroborate your story? I cannot. It was at six in the morning. Yes, before any of your servants were down. Yes, they're no better at getting up than most people. Uh, later, when the servants were about, did you give your bathing suit to anyone to have it dried or leave it out for that purpose? I did not. Why not? Because I wore no bathing suit. <laughs> Silence! Did you value the ring? I, I didn't quite catch what you said. Uh, sorry. Did you value the ring? 
I liked it. Did you value it? Well, I, uh, I used it for sealing letters. It was a useful ring to me. Did you value it sufficiently to buy another, practically identical, to take its place? Yes, if you put it that way. And you bought it at the first opportunity on the very day after you returned to London? Yes, Garrington's, the jewellers, where I bought it, have given you the date. Mr. Attorney, may I have the two rings again? If your lordship pleases. Would you be prepared to point out any difference between the two rings? No, my lord, I... I should go further than the Attorney General. I should say they are absolutely identical. A gentleman of the jury, you shall have the rings to examine when you retire to consider your verdict. Yes, Mr. Attorney? Did you invariably wear the second ring up to the night of your arrest? Generally. Why did you buy it? Take the place of the other one. So as to run no further risk of its absence being noticed? No. Do you swear to that? I do. Was this a, a, a pleasant bathe? In a, in, a, in a way. Oh, may I take it that it was not an unpleasant bathe? My Lord, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't say. But you were able to do it in the very spot where that boy had met his death three days before. Which, if I had been guilty of this foul crime, would have taken some doing. Doesn't it strike you as being an extraordinary thing to be able no, to do? My, my Lord, I... Might, might I sit down again? Extremely sorry, Sir John. I, I feel all right now. I think you wish me to repeat my last question. Yes, please. Doesn't it strike you as being an extraordinary thing to be able to bathe in that very spot where that boy met his death three days before? As to how it strikes me is perhaps less important than how it strikes the jury. Isn't it a fact that you never bathe there at all after the boy's death? No, it is not. Isn't it a fact that you lost that ring in a struggle with him when he met his death? No, before God, no. As isn't it a you fact You must that... let me finish what I was going to say. You spun a web round me of the most appalling kind. And there are certain facts against which I can't get over. But I told you the truth. You've assailed my moral character and I have attempted to defend it. I don't defend it. I've been as candid as I could, gentlemen. But when the prosecution charged me with this crime, they commit one in doing so. I swear solemnly that I am innocent. Your witness, Mr. Aid. I know you've been very ill, Sir Hubert. Just answer quietly the few further questions I'll put to you. <clears throat> you don't dispute the financial aspects of this case? No, not in the least. Nor in that respect, your relationship with Mrs. Scale and your owing her £2,000? I wish I could dispute it. There is much in my life I wish I hadn't done. As to your liabilities, had you any notion that after the tragedy, your wife would settle them? I had not. I might add that my wife and I were not happy together, through my fault, not hers. In fact, has your wife settled all your liabilities? Every one, my lord. What was the first intimation you had of her intention of doing this? Through her solicitor, She might have declined to assist her at all. And she would have... To break the silence, stand tall against the wall. We'll ignite the night, let our spirits divide. been justified. I am prepared to say in open court that I have treated my wife for a problem. Sir Hubert, the you have said that you bought the second ring at Garrington's upon the day after your return to London. Upon the very day after, to use my learned friend's expression. Yes. Was there anything in the wide world to prevent your motoring to Garrington's the 12 miles from Wilbury 
Upon any day before that you chose to do so, if you'd been in a desperate hurry to replace the ring? Nothing. Whatever. When your brother-in-law went to bathe, leaving you in the library, was that the last occasion on which you were in his company? It was. One final question. Did you kill Eustace Eve? No. Witness, if I'm, you were... I'm so sorry, my lord. I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling well. All right, you can go back to the dock. Call Lady Ware. Lady Ware! I swear by Almighty God that the evidence which I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Lady Ware, you are the wife of the prisoner? I am. I have only a few questions to ask you. Your husband has told us that you and he were not happy together. Is that true? Quite true. We've heard him blame himself in that regard, so I won't ask your view of the matter. The payment of his debts, was that an entirely spontaneous action on your part? Entirely. He never asked you to help him? No. And I think it probable he didn't think I would do so. We... We were very unhappy at that time. Lady Ware, you arranged to pay that £2,000 to Mrs. Cale? Yes. Isn't it enough that I arranged to pay all his debts? Certainly. I take your answer. Three days after the tragedy, were you aware, or had you any knowledge, of his bathing in the lake? Unfortunately, no. But it was a very common thing for him to do. This ring of which we've heard so much, were there occasions on which your husband did not wear it? Oh, yes, frequent. For instance, when he played golf. And its absence sometimes from his finger wouldn't surprise you. Not in the slightest. And if I had noticed it, neither that nor anything else in the case would have led me to doubt his innocence. We cannot have your opinion, My Lady brother Ware. was a very weak swimmer, and I'm convinced his death was an accident. Oh, do you seriously suggest that? After the medical evidence... And after the gardener's story as to his seeing another man bending over the punch. I do, and I think the gardener, who was a great distance away, made a mistake. I see. Uh, Mr. Attorney, I am going to call evidence to prove it was a mistake. <laughs> Lady Ware, you say you knew nothing of this early morning bathe of your husband? No. My husband and I had separate rooms. Don't you think it is remarkable that he was able to do such a thing? No, I do not. Do you mean that? I do, and I will give my reason. I consider my husband an abnormal man. An abnormal man? Yes. But not so abnormal as to be able to commit murder. No. To be morally bad is one thing. To be criminally bad is another. Silence. I think, Mr. Attorney, this is argument. The witness's opinion, you know. Thank you, my lord. I have nothing further to ask the witness. Just attend to me one moment, Lady Ware. On the night of the tragedy, where was your husband? At Wilbury, my lord. Yes, yes, but I understand that you and your husband did not occupy the same room. No, but that night my husband and Miss Wilson sat up very late with me. I was very hysterical, and no one could have been kinder than he was, or more helpful. <laughs> Uh, thank you. That will do. <laughs> Call Thomas Bold. Thomas Bold. Who, uh, uh, what name? Bold. B O L D. <coughs> the book in the right hand. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence which I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thomas Bold is your name? Yes, sir. And you've been a bookmaker? That's right, sir. Well known in the ring once. Uh, but I've fallen on bad times. Uh, <laughs> it was like this, gentlemen, I... <laughs> Never mind that for the moment. Now, were you at Wilbury on September the 10th last? That's right, sir. Ledger day. I was near starving, and not knowing where to turn, I tramped the road to Wilbury. I knew Sir Hubert had a kind heart, and I, uh, I asked him for help. And did he help you? That's right, sir. No half-crown or five bob touch, but a fiver. Uh, he's a tip-top on his Sir Hubert. And then, uh, tell your story to the jury in your own way. Well, he, 
He gave me food, gentlemen, and told me to stroll in the grads before I returned to London. So I, I wandered about till I come to the lake. And within about a couple of hundred yards of a boathouse, I, I felt sleepy-like and I curled up under a tree. Presently, I woke up. And I saw a young gentleman with a towel round his neck come to the boathouse. Do you remember how he was dressed at all? Uh, not quite so fast, Mr. A. I beg your lordship's pardon. Yes? Uh, do you remember how he was dressed at all? A, a, a light suit, sir, and one of them trilby hats. White, it looked. Quite right. Had you ever seen him before? Never in my life. Then he went into the boathouse. Alone? That's right, sir, quite alone. Then he came out again, dressed as he was, and... Walked to the punt at the side. He unchained it. Can you swear to that? On me oath. Then he got into the punt and shoved it off. And as he did so, he, he lost his balance and fell forward. And I thought he knocked his head somehow against the edge of the punt. He put his hand up like this. But it didn't seem to upset him much. He came back and then got out. One moment. Yes? Did he chain up the punt again? Oh, no, sir. I don't think he did. Uh, then he went into the bathing shed. Still alone? That's right, sir. And then? Then he... He come out in his bathing suit on the landing stage, went down the steps into the water. You saw that distinctly? That's right, sir. He, he sort of felt the water first with his toe to see if it was cold. <laughs> Funky-like. <laughs> and no one was with him or near him at hand? Not a soul, sir. Could you have recognised Sir Hubert if he'd been there? Of course, sir. But he wasn't. On my oath, he wasn't. Uh -huh. And then, did the young fellow swim or what? Uh, that's right, sir. But not very grandly, I thought. He swam some little way out. And just about then, I, I got up, went off to the station. I wasn't thinking anything about it. But just before I started off, I remember I did look round. But the young gentleman wasn't there anymore. I thought he'd gone back to the shed. What did you do then? I went to the station and took me ticket for London. I'm going to call the booking clerk, my lord. No, what clerk? I am addressing his lordship. Oh, you don't want to call no booking clerk. I took the ticket out and tell all about it. Don't argue. <laughs> now, Bold, when did you first tell this story to the prisoner's advisers? Uh, only after all the police court proceedings were over. Why not before? Just explain, quite frankly to the jury, why you allowed all those weeks to pass since Sir Hubert's arrest before giving your information? Because, gentlemen, since October I was in prison. Two months hard for stealing to keep alive. And I never heard a word about the case till I come out. That's all for the moment. Your witness, Mr. Turney. What did you do with the five pounds the prisoner gave you? Helped to pal with some. Back the loser with the rest. Where were you in prison? Stafford, sir. Were you justly convicted? Uh, well, sir, that all depends on your point of view. Had you committed theft? That's right, sir. Did you plead guilty? No, no, sir. Did you go into the witness box and give evidence on oath? That's right, sir. And swore the charge was false? That's right, sir. I meant to write it to the finish. Well, when you came out of prison, how did you first hear of this charge against the prisoner? From the paper, sir. So I imagined. A full account of the police court proceedings? Oh, uh, no, sir, no. Only a sort of paragraph just referring to the case and, and saying you were going to prosecute and Mr. A defend. Was that all it said? No, sir, not quite. It had headline. No doubt you're accurate upon that point. Did you buy this paper? That's right, sir. The Echo. Just that one paper? That's all, sir. What else did it say? Well, just shortly what Sir Hubert was charged with. Not much more, no details. And simply on the strength of that, you told your story to the prisoner's advisers? That's right, sir. Didn't you know that your story contradicted in detail the case for the prosecution? Yes, sir. How did you know? How did I know? Why, well, from the paragraph I've told you about. That short paragraph? That's right, sir. And on the strength of that paragraph only, you go to the prisoner's advisers and give them all these elaborate details, the boy falling into the punt and hitting his forehead and the rest? Yes, right, sir. On your oath, sir, didn't you buy all the newspapers you could containing the evidence at the police court before you went with your story? No, sir, I did not. <laughs> Thomas Bowl, have you anything in the world to gain by committing perjury in that box? Nothing, sir. I'm not very long for this world, but before I go, I mean...
Try to save an innocent man. By telling the truth. That's right, sir. God help me. <coughs> uh, witness, this paragraph in the paper that you read, was it an evening paper? Uh, that's right, sir. Uh, my lord. I always read the sun, my lord. But I thought you said this was the echo. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, that's how it was. Uh, I bought the sun afterwards. Then you bought two papers. Um... Uh, y yes, my lord. Uh, see if the other said any more, but it, it didn't. Listen, before you went to the prisoner's solicitor, did you know that your story of the dead boy hitting his head on the punt would account equally well as the doctor's evidence for the bruise? That's right, sir. Uh, lordship, uh, uh, I, I knew that. You did know that? Um, uh, I beg pardon, my lord. I'm uh, rather confused. That will do. Uh, thank you, my lord. <laughs> Mr. Aid, have you many more witnesses to call? Uh, only three, my lord. Members of the jury, I'm anxious for the case to be concluded sometime tonight, so that you needn't be locked up for another night over Sunday. We'll adjourn now for a quarter of an hour. the evidence in detail. I shall not detain you much longer. My learned friend will argue that it's not credible that an innocent man could bring himself to bathe where only three days before his brother-in-law was drowned. I will put it to you in a different light and in the one which I believe you will accept, that it's inconceivable for a guilty man to be able to go near the spot at all. Remember also the ring was not found when the body was found. It was discovered weeks afterwards when they dragged the lake a second time. Is that not consistent with the prisoner's account that he lost the ring after Eustace Ede's death? I submit respectfully that that point is worthy of your grave consideration. As to the prisoner's moral character, which has been fearlessly laid bare to you, I hold no brief for that. I am not here to defend that. He himself has not sought to defend it. And I make bold to say that there are many persons here in this court who would not care to publish their full histories to the world. But they need not be murders. Members of the jury, the prisoner at the bar is a fortunate man in several respects. He is prosecuted by the Attorney General with all the fairness which distinguishes him. His trial is presided over, I say with the greatest respect, by one of the learned judges of England, who is renowned for his scrupulous care and impartiality. His case is being tried by you, in whose hands his fate lies. And speaking for myself, I can only thank you for the patience you have shown me. And last, but not least, his very life is being fought for by his wife. A woman who, if I am any judge of character, has in this court won not only the sympathy, but the admiration of all. In these days of skepticism, when the world seems packed with cynics and often bereft of what is fine and noble, you and I, and every soul here, will be able to look back upon this terrible story with gratitude to that woman who has shown us all, old and young, that human nature has beauty in it still. But it is not upon a recollection of her in that box that I am going to ask you with an unbounded confidence to acquit the man at the bar. It is upon the evidence upon the facts, and upon the facts alone. Cast all sentiment from you, fling it away. And as men of the world, see if you, or any one of you, can conscientiously send that man to his death. 
Are you going to assume the responsibility of saying that this is more than a case of extraordinary coincidence? You've seen the prisoner there facing his ordeal. A man of position charged with this awful thing with the eyes of all the world upon him. Were you not impressed by his candor? Would you say that he was lying? Did he strike you so unfavorably that you are convinced he was capable of writing the letter on that day to Lausanne while all the time he meant to kill his brother-in-law? Yet, that is the case for the Crown. Members of the jury, the responsibility upon me is heavy, and for any omissions on my part, I crave your indulgence. While I ask you to remember, as I know my Lord will tell you, that no prisoner in England has to prove his innocence, but that the burden is on the prosecution to establish his guilt to the satisfaction of a jury beyond all reasonable doubt. Have they done that? I am not afraid of your answer. May it please your lordship. Members of the jury, we who spend our lives in courts of justice are accustomed to the power and eloquence of my learned friend. But you, I venture to say, who possibly have listened to him for the first time, will school yourselves, in accordance with the oath that you have taken, to weigh only the evidence in this extraordinary story and to be influenced not by any fervent words of his, nor by any pity that you may feel for individuals, but by hard facts. If individuals and their feelings are to be remembered by you, I submit there is one who deserves your pity. That is the boy who was done to death on that afternoon of September the 10th. Now, I agree with my learned friend. It is incumbent on the prosecution to prove the prisoner's guilt to your satisfaction. Have not the prosecution done so? Can you disbelieve the testimony against him? Is it not beyond suspicion? Then ask yourselves if that for the defense is equally reliable. I shall revert to that. Now, as to Lady Ware, admitting the world to be sceptical and cynical, I think you will agree with me that there are few wives who, in a like position, would not have acted in precisely the same way. She strenuously denies that there was ever any communication between her and the prisoner as to her paying his debts after the death of the boy. Assuming that to be true, and God forbid that we should blame her if it is not true, we have seen what she will endure for that man. And in that regard, I am as ready to pay my tribute to her as is my learned friend. But with that generous nature, which her husband recognized well enough, is it not at least conceivable that communication or no communication between them, he might have had a very shrewd opinion that she would rescue him from his difficulties? At any rate... She did rescue him. Members of the jury, let me remind you of a significant phrase. Lady Ware described the prisoner as an abnormal man. I don't know what you thought of that definition, but it was a remarkable one, wasn't it? And from the point of view of the prosecution, it is the most accurate description that could be given of him. He is an abnormal man. And now, step by step, I shall show you how. The clouds of ruin had been gathering round the prisoner, and on that day of September the 10th, there burst upon him one which overwhelmed him, the urgent message from Mr. Ingleworth, the stockbroker, a claim taken with the rest which he could not meet except through one contingency, the death of Eustace Ede, whose fortune would then pass to Lady Ware. He knew that. It's proved that he knew it. 
And what happens? Eustace E. dies within an hour. Do you believe for an instant that it was accidental? Consider that similar French crime read and digested by the prisoner the very day before. The blow on the forehead. The loss of the ring, which could have caused the wound, and, as I submit to you, did cause it. And stranger still, the purchase of the second ring, absolutely identical. Piece those facts together. And remember that that boy's death meant everything to that man. My lord, my wife is ill. Witness, you must keep silent. Just a few moments, Mr. Attorney. What are they shouting now, Marston? Nothing fresh. <sighs> Is that wretched, gaping crowd still out there? Yes. How long have you been here, M.A.? Half an hour. But I don't want to disturb Celia. How is she? Oh, she insists on coming in to see you. Did you have the telephone disconnected? Yes, whenever we got back. It would never do for any news to reach her too suddenly. No. Rate has the car there and will drive straight here. Is... Is there any news? No, no, not yet. The jury is still out. Shh, shh, she's coming. But it's, it's not over, is it? No, not yet. Why have you left the court? I left my junior to take the verdict. There was nothing more that I could do. Oh, don't think me ungrateful, Mike. I shall never forget what you've done for him. How... How far they got? The judge finished his summing up and the jury retired. Don't hide anything, Mike. Tell me everything. How did the judge sum up? Very fairly, as he always does. About half past nine, I thought the jury wouldn't be long. Why? Because they sent a note to the judge. A note? Why? Probably asking some questions. Well? The judge sent back his reply from his private room. I saw the clerk of the court bring it through. That often means they agree soon afterwards. Oh, then you think there's hope? A real hope? Why, of course. There's a tremendous feeling for him. A great crowd outside in Newgate Street was calling three cheers for Hubie Ware. Oh, were they, Marston? Oh, don't pay any attention to me. Oh, I'm terrified. Don't leave me, Michael. We should be in the dining room. All right, Marston. Oh, how can I ever thank you for all you've done for him? If he's spared, it's you who'll have saved his life. Nonsense. But you're not as hopeful as Marston. <laughs> I'm not as young. And perhaps defending a man you know brings you too close to it all. But you do believe he's innocent? With all my heart. Then they can't make the mistake. They, they can't. Has such a ghastly thing ever happened? What? An innocent man condemned. Very rarely in this country. Oh, then he's safe. He must be safe. Why are they so long? Because they can't agree. But surely Bowles' evidence alone... And those last answers of his to the judge were not very helpful. Did the judge refer to them? Yes, but very fairly. How do you mean? He told the jury they might take the view that the man was confused and didn't realise quite what he was saying. But he said they must scrutinise his evidence carefully. And also that, though he need not necessarily be committing perjury, they were entitled to take into consideration his past record. I see... What's the time? Uh, uh, quarter to eleven. Two hours out. Oh. Ah, now, Magda, oh. courage. Remember, it was your husband's bearing in the box that made the greatest impression. He was brave, wasn't he? There was only one other witness who surpassed him. Yourself. Oh, no. Can you imagine what it meant to me to have to put those questions to you? Michael, dear... I shall never forget you. I shall never forget anything. But I shall have to be a changed woman after all this. How do you mean? This awful trial must be his atonement for all that's past. If justice can bring him back, 
I'm ready to begin afresh. Do you understand? Yes, Magda. But justice won't. There is no justice. They're going to find an innocent man guilty. Magda, my dear, oh, you must... I've been too hard. I might have appealed to his better side and been more patient, more tolerant. No woman could have behaved better than you've done. I've never given him a chance. Nonsense. Not a real chance, I mean. I might have prevented all this. You could never have prevented it. You could never have prevented anything. He wouldn't allow you to. Oh, but, Michael, you pity him, don't you? At this moment, I pity him with all my soul. That, that's our door. Someone's come. Oh, what are they going to tell me? Hubert. Oh, Hubert. Where? I'm so glad. Thank you. Right. Don't try to speak. I'll join the others. I brought this champagne for Sir Hubert, my lady. I think your ladyship should make him take it. Thank you, Raid. And, Sir Hubert, here are your things. They returned from the present. Your cigarette case, your watch and chain, and your keys. Good. My lady, I, I, I don't know what to say. Thank you, Raid. Thank you. Hubert, drink this. Hmm? Oh, no. No, I don't think I can. Please. Have you had any food? No. No, I, I couldn't. You've had nothing? Oh, no, something at eight this morning. I have not been able to manage anything since. Hubert. Oh, my dear. Oh, they were awfully good to me. Awfully good to me. Tried to persuade me and all that, but I couldn't. And beyond it. Beyond it. Is it cold in here? Is it my fancy? Try to drink some more. It'll warm you. Very oh, well, yeah. <clears throat> you were right, Magda. This is the best thing I could take. I should like more. Might help me to forget. Yes, dear. If only I could forget. Ah, that's better. Oh, you've got so thin, Hubert. Yes, I've lost weight, they tell me. I wonder you're alive. I don't know that I'm alive. Wouldn't care if I wasn't. Shh. No, I don't. For two whole months, I've fought for life. I've been in terror of the other thing. I've clutched at everything like a drowning man. Drowning man. I can't get away from that horror. It'll never leave me at all, Smith. Oh, darling, don't talk. Drink some more champagne. And now that I've got my life, I don't know what to... I should like to kill the fiends who have brought you to this. Oh, they're not such a bad lot, really. It's all infernally exaggerated, all that side of it. Why, I remember... I remember now, even one of those warder fellows asked me to drink his health tonight. It, it is tonight, isn't it? Yes, dear. Well, here's going. Well, sit quietly, Hubert. You're not strong enough to... Try to be quiet for a little. I want to talk to oh, you. No, no, you I... have only to listen. Only two months ago, here in this room, you asked me if we couldn't start afresh, and I refused. Hubert, listen. It's for me to repent, not you. And I ask you to forgive me for never helping you in your life. I might have made it better. You might never have acted as you did. I tell you that the past is buried. I've come through that awful trial because I knew the cruelty of the charge. But you're innocent. You're proved innocent, no. my dear. No. I did it. What? I did it. No. 
No! What is it? Yes, Michael, thanks to you, I'm not guilty, but I did it. I killed Eustace Ede. Good God, and I got you off. Yes, but you can't touch me now. I'm free. None of them can touch me. I've cheated them, done a lot of them. I know the Lord of the land. Listen to them out there. They're calling for me. They like me. I'll go to the window and give them a wave. Listen to them. They don't know. But you hear them? And I killed him. I killed him. His weak, mean, useless little face was there. And then suddenly I thought, Magda, Wilbury, I shattered it. I killed him. I killed him. Look out, man. Oh! Don't move. Magda, my dear, you mustn't look. He's dead. He's dead, my dear. <laughs>